welcome back to The Human Perspective. Today, I'm really happy that we're gonna be interviewing Galen Lee, and we've invited her husband, Paul Tressler, to also join, kind of be an observer, but say hello. Hi, Paul. Hi. So, um, actually, I had the opportunity to first meet Galen and Paul at the U.S. Department of State, I think it was in 2018. Uh, when Ann Cody, who works at State, invited them in to do a performance. And um, it was great. And so Galen and I, over the years, have developed more of a relationship, primarily on the phone, um, but also as she's been progressing with her music. So Galen, um, could you give us a little bit of background about who you are and why you got into music in the first place? Yeah, um, well, I am from Duluth, Minnesota, and um, born and raised, and still live here now. And my background, I guess my relationship with music started pretty young. I was in fourth grade, and an orchestra came and played for my school, and I just fell in love with the sound of the strings, and I knew I wanted to try a stringed instrument in fifth grade when orchestra started. Um, and I just got really lucky. I didn't realize that at the time until I was an adult actually, that the teacher in the orchestra program, she could tell I had a really good ear. So she said, I don't know how you'll play, but I think we should try to find a way for you to do it. So we experimented with the cello, but it was too big. I couldn't reach down where the bow needed to go. Um, and the violin, even the teeny tiny ones for little kids, I couldn't get it up on my shoulder. My arms just weren't long enough. Um, and so we, I don't know who thought of it originally, but we were like, maybe you could play violin like a cello up and down in your wheelchair, but I couldn't hold the bow the right way. Um, so we decided I would hold it like a bass player does. So we kind of put all this stuff together. Um, and once we had a method that worked, it, it was sort of just like learning any other instrument. You sound really bad for a couple of years and you progressively get better. Um, and so I have been playing for 26 years now. Um, and it took a while for me to realize that if she had just said, you have a good ear, but this won't work, you should just do choir or something. My entire life would look completely different. Um, so now I, I started out teaching fiddle in 2013 and I won a national contest in 2016 through NPR Music. And that kind of jumpstarted. That was the uh, Tiny Desk Contest. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was a, a really big turn of events for me because at that point I had only played locally um, in Minnesota and never toured once in my whole life. So that just all of a sudden totally rerouted the path of my life and now I've been doing a lot of stuff on the road. Do you remember the name of the teacher? Yes. Oh, of course. Susan Sommerfeld. Um, what's super cool about her is she and I have seen each other a few times um, since then. She's come to some of my shows. And she, of course, had no idea, and neither did I, that I would end up being a professional musician. And she, she's just really over the moon. Like, she's really glad that it has worked out this way. So, and so I think it's such a great example of a teacher who saw your talent. And from your bio, what I read was you, you excelled in this area. Yeah. And so she, did you ever ask her why she took such an interest in you? Yeah, actually one time it's because the, before you join orchestra, they require you to take a music listening test. So you kind of you tell which note is higher, which note is lower, whatever. And I was the only student that year that got a perfect score. And so she knew that I had musical ability and she saw my enthusiasm and she just felt like it wouldn't be right of her to say like, no, you can't do this. So she said, she was very honest. She said, I don't know if this will work and I've never done it and maybe we won't find a way to play, but let's at least try. And I think, the more I've reflected on that as an adult, I think it's important for teachers of all students, not just disabled students, but all students to just not put up barriers where there don't have to be any. And, and she focused with me on the sound, not so much the technique, because my technique is pretty much completely different than a normal violinist or whatever. Um, but we focused on the sound and the techniques that I could do 
um, that translated from cello or whatever. We did focus on skill building, but it was different. The output, it was the sound that mattered, not so much did it look the same way as everybody else. And I think a lot of kids of any, of, of, you know, physical or um, intellectual range get discouraged from things like music because there's such a set technique and teachers can't think outside of that. And I think that she, her method could be applied to a lot of different students with more success. Because how many kids quit music thinking, oh, I'm bad at this, and then they never pick it up again. And that's really sad for an elementary school kid to run into that. Did your family support you as you were studying music? Yes. <clears throat> my, my parents have always used the adage, if you really want to do it, you'll figure it out. That's what they always told me about basically everything that I ever tried to do. Um, and music was no different. The funny thing is I didn't know it when I came home and said I want to play strings when I go to fifth grade. Apparently my mom kind of panicked inside because she was like, this might be the one thing that we can't figure out for, you know, and, but she did not tell that to me. She said, um, if you really want to do it, you'll figure it out. And then I did with the help of my teacher. And so um, she didn't know anything about stringed instruments. So she was not going to be able to assist me with that one. So um, yeah, my parents have always been, I mean, I'm so lucky to have them. Um, they've always been really supportive, but not overprotective either. So like, I mean, not any more than all moms are to some extent. They're kids, right? Right. But so when you went to college, you majored in political science, uh, not in music. Did you minor in music? No. Um, so no. Why, didn't, why didn't you want to study music? Um, you know, I really am interested in politics and psychology. Those are probably the two, besides music, like intellectually, the things that drive me the most. And um, I tried orchestra in college, but we had had a really fun tight-knit group in high school and the college vibe was just very different the instructor was not really that interested in the class and it wasn't fun and I was like you know I can do music a different way so I joined a fiddling group where once a week we met and we played fiddle tunes together and we had a concert once a semester and it's very low-key but I kept playing throughout college but I didn't do it for um, like any degree program um, I, I was never expecting to do music as a living. I really thought I would go into like disability law or um, run for political office or something. That was sort of my trajectory in my mind. And then it just, all these opportunities have opened up and I really enjoy it. So I'm not going to say no to doing something that's really cool, but. Well, who knows, you could good. run for political office. You're certainly young enough to be able to do that at some point. How did you and Paul meet? We met. Do you want to talk? Well, no, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, we met at an open mic. Um, I was playing, but I, I had already been done. I was done. But he came in with a group of friends. And there was a mutual friend connector, and we mm -hmm. started chatting it up. Um, and then we went camping as a big group. She had a crush on one of my friends at first, though. For a day. Yes, I will admit. It's true. <laughs> His roommate, uh, Ben, but I could tell Ben had a crush on my cousin. So I backed up <laughs> and then looked around and started chatting with Paul and realized he was a really cool person. And then it worked out. It did work out. We went camping a couple of times with our friends and then started hanging out and started dating about six months after that, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been together? Together for almost 14 years, but we um, have been married almost seven years. So, and so you work together, right? Now we do. <laughs> Sorry. Now we do. We did not yeah. start that way, but um, oh, yeah. He was a custodian at the university right. for almost a decade, and I was teaching fiddle lessons. So we had our own things going. But when I won the tiny desk, we started talking about if touring was something we really wanted to do that we probably had to do it full time because he couldn't, I didn't want him to spend every vacation day of his life on tour with me and I would need support and I could bring a personal care assistant, but I knew I wasn't going to want to be away from home that long without him all the time. And he was flexible. He said, you know, what, whatever, my job doesn't define like my meaning in life. So we decided that we would try it and his work was great. They gave him a seven month leave of absence to try it out. 
And if it wasn't something that we felt was sustainable, then he could go back to his old job. So they were, they considered it like a sabbatical kind of, right? The sabbatical, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that it was cool. So we got to try it and it was fun and challenging to work together, but not like insurmountable challenging, you know, and we're still doing it four years later, I guess. Yeah. Did that again? We're still doing that four years later. We've, mm -hmm. we've been working together now for about four years. So Galen, um, about how many cities have you two traveled to? Cities? I am not sure. I know for sure that we've played in 45 states and nine countries, but I, cities probably hundreds at this yeah. point. I mean, we've done a lot of traveling. About, how many shows would you say? I, Can you at least 600 probably. I mean, a lot of shows. We do about 150 to 200 a year, depending on the year. Um, wow. So, so tell me, um, or tell us, when kids with disabilities and adults with disabilities, what are some of the things that people have said to you? Well, I think the kinds of things that keep me going, because it is, we can talk about that later, but it, as a touring artist with a disability, there's a lot of logistical barriers still in the music industry that make it can be pretty frustrating and takes a lot more time to do what I do booking wise. But what is rewarding to me is when people like there was an adult with a disability that emailed me after my show and she said, you know, I'm 50 and I realized tonight at my, at your show that I've never seen someone who shared anything relating to my life experience on stage before. And that meant a lot to me. Um, and then whenever kids with disabilities come to my show, is it really like, I want them to see, cause I didn't get to see anyone like me growing up performing and just to, you know, a lot of them tell me they want to be musicians and stuff or that they want to learn the violin, you know, and now they're going to try it to play it up and down and that kind of thing. And it, I just think it's really cool to know that they have some example ahead of them. And I really want to work on accessibility in the arts because I don't want them to become adults and realize how hard it is. It shouldn't be this hard by the time they're adults. I want it to be easier and more equal access for them. So that's the kind of stuff that keeps me going. Even, I mean, there's this, uh, this girl, a younger girl with a developmental disability that came to my show and she was in the front row. And during the sing-along, there's a sing-along in a lot of my concerts, she kind of got really agitated and they almost asked her to leave, but they didn't, which I'm glad. And she, she kind of calmed down. But after the show, she came on stage and she started crying. And I realized she was excited because she, her mom's like, she listens to you every day and here's her violin. She wanted to show uh, it to you. And like, she, and I was like, wait, were you upset during Birdsong because you were excited? And she just said, yeah. And it was just so cool because it's like, I just think the diversity of human experience has become really like a cool, like a something I never pictured being a part of being a touring artist is like just realizing how cool the world is. There's so many people in it that are like amazing and you don't get to see them in your daily life as much as if you're traveling and meeting them. And so it's been really, there's been some really positive times. Um, those are some of the highlights I would say. Tell me how COVID has affected your business. <laughs> well, it forced it to go online, basically. Um, you know, I have really small lungs and I have asthma and I'm not going to put myself in danger um, if I don't have to. And and I also kind of in solidarity, I know a lot of people who live at group homes are not being really even allowed to go outside. And so I decided really early on, um, March 20th was my first show I did. I'm doing an online concert every Sunday afternoon um, on YouTube. And I notice a lot of the audience um, are disabled people and not everybody, of course, but, and they're from all over the world, which has been really cool because that's, again, there's so many countries we haven't been to. So I've been able to connect with people in different parts of the world every week. And then the surprising part has been that a lot of conferences have gone virtual and so I've actually been a lot busier than I was expecting. I've been doing a lot of speaking yeah. and playing. Um, and it's like, I didn't know you could be so busy in your own house, kind of, you know? So, um, yeah. but I'm grateful for that. And it, when, if ever things do slow down, 
my next big bucket list project is to write a book about touring and this transition to COVID and kind of thinking about disability rights and diversity um, in the arts especially. And I think that will be eventually something I get to. And I kind of thought it would happen right away because of COVID, but we've been too busy. Like, I think I have six shows this week or something ridiculous because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is great, but also not what I was expecting, I guess. So we've come to the end. I'm really sorry. It's okay. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so we're going to put up links yeah. so that you can um, find Galen's music. And uh, Galen, what are your parting words for budding disabled musicians? Um, just remember that disability is a form of diversity that can be celebrated and that you're part of that puzzle, like the cultural shift that we need to see for disability to become just an integral part of society like any other cultural group. Um, arts are the way that you kind of pave the way to educate people through arts. And I think what disabled artists can do is just um, just get out there and do it as much as they can. And, and don't feel like you have to sacrifice your own accessibility for the arts. You know, I've had to do a lot of um, digging to find accessible venues, but it pays off because if you set boundaries for yourself, like I will only do accessible spaces, that that creates change because the venue owners that you're talking to are being introduced to this idea that they haven't really considered before. So you're doing something good for the overall culture. And just remember that it's not about how many people um, listen to you. It's about the people that you're able to really impact. It doesn't have to be a lot um, to be a valuable thing. So, Well, I want to say that my goal is that you impact a lot of people, not a few people. <laughs> and uh, that's my goal. Um, Galen, outside of being an amazing musician, I think clearly is a very strong advocate and really um, is someone we'll follow in the future and then look to the people that you're influencing who are gonna move forward. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Galen. And uh, everyone listen to the music afterwards and please share it with your friends. Bye now. Bye. That history won't forget us or try to minimize our pain. And so I wait.